Hi guys, EEPROM programmer part 5 of this series and should be the last and in the last video I was up to my first attempt at automating the switching between 5 and 12.5 volts for the EEPROM programming pin uh, so that I didn't need a mechanical switch. Making use of a part I already had spare, this is a Texas Instruments H-Bridge driver. Before looking into that I'll try explaining conceptually first. First up we have a traditional RC reset delay circuit tied to one input of an AND gate. At power up it takes some time for the capacitor to be charged through the resistor before it pulls the input to the AND gate high. The power up delay time with the input to the AND gate held low makes it impossible for the AND gate to initially switch 12.5 volt to the EEPROM programming pin. From then on, for the entire power cycle, the reset circuit is holding the first input to the AND gate high, but by that time the microcontroller has had time to pull the second input low. Because at least one input to the AND gate has always been held low, we've done the power up without ever switching the programming voltage to the EEPROM. While the microcontroller is holding the AND gate input low, it's also holding an inverter input low, and that means that the inverter output is high, and it's actually providing a 5 volt output for the EEPROM programming pin that keeps it in read mode. From here if I want to send the programming voltage to the EEPROM pin I've just got to set the microcontroller pin high, the output of the inverter will be low and the output of the AND gate will be high and switch 12 volt to the pin. The purpose of this uh, diode is uh, it's 1N4148 and it's just to prevent the output of the 5 volt inverter ever seeing the programming voltage. At least that's what I'd do if I was buying the components but I've got a drawer uh, with a, a lot of spare of what Texas Instruments call quad half H bridge drivers uh, which are basically motor drivers. Um, they're basically non-inverting buffers with enable pins and a power supply that they can provide a switch for um, and that makes one quarter of this chip uh, an AND gate uh, using the enable pin and the input uh, that essentially replaces the AND gate and with the enable pin switched off uh, it turns the output into a high impedance state so it, uh, yeah, it just worked out nicely so the big test, when I start the device, the software is actually in an idle mode waiting uh, for a button press to perform a function, but that actually keeps the EEPROM in read mode, so I should expect to see 5 volts minus the forward voltage drop of the diode on the EEPROM programming pin until I push a button to set it in a write mode, and then I should see the 12.5 volts on the programming pin, and the 12.45 is well within spec. This is definitely more build log type stuff than how to uh, type of stuff uh, but I thought it would be good to offer up at least one look at hardware and one look at software and what I'll be showing you is the verify mode. While mode equals 3 which is verify mode and EEPROM address is below the 1 megabyte uh, range for the address to overflow uh, basically forms an AND gate and uh, is prevented from running at startup because one of the inputs isn't true, and that's the mode. The mode is set to 3 by a button scanning routine in mode 0, which is the idle mode. Then the code underneath this can execute, and the first thing that happens is the EEPROM address is shifted out to the cascaded row of shift registers, and then latched. The longest delay in the whole program happens at the end there, 5 thingy bobs, which isn't actually milliseconds. Um, to wait for the access and the address lines to settle, uh, then to shift the data in. The data is shifted in 16 bits at a time, so I'm writing to a 1 kilobyte array 2 bytes at a time. That would look nicer masking than just pushing bits out of the variable uh, with rotation, but it didn't cost me any more time. Remembering we read in 2 bytes of data from the EEPROM for each cycle, for every kilobyte that we've read in, uh, we're also going to load in one kilobyte from the file that we're verifying against into a verify buffer, which is also one kilobyte in length. The same code here is checking if we have to open the file because it's the first time we've accessed the file, or if we have to close the file because we're at the end of the EEPROM addressing space. 
at the same kilobyte mark for every kilobyte. This is where the verify buffer actually gets checked against the data buffer that was read from RAM. If any byte fails, then we can just exit immediately back to mode 0, the idle mode. If just one byte's wrong, that means the verify operation is over, and we can set a flag to say that it failed to be displayed in mode 0. If the two 1 kilobyte buffers compare the same, which means 1 kilobyte of the file matched 1 kilobyte of the EEPROM data, we can continue incrementing a counter uh, until we reach the next even 1 kilobyte value. We also increment the EEPROM address, and remember we're still within our brace that was keeping us in range of the EEPROM addressing space. When the EEPROM address exceeds the range limit that was checked at the start, we're on the other side of this branch and can assume the operation was a success, simply because it didn't quit. Shifting the FF values out to the data bus in a verify mode does nothing. But in a write mode, where are we writing to the data bus, it would finish off nicely with all the LEDs lit. I've got a feeling this video has an imbalance about it, maybe not across the whole series of five, uh, but let me know if that's a waste of time anyway, because it's a lot more exhausting than showing these kind of videos and stills. Some kind of spacecraft or watercraft. Uh, the goal with this project was quite different to what it usually is. I wanted it done fast and preferably out of parts that I already had and there were compromises for that. Um, it's not the way I'd go if I were trying to streamline something or make it as fast as I could, especially the addressing with shift registers instead of a binary counter. But considering this photo is dated the 13th of March, I got the whole thing done in less than a month, uh, closer to three and a half weeks and I had an EEPROM programmed probably in about three weeks. I've programmed and verified another EEPROM while the unit's been assembled like this just for testing, and at the last minute I added this bull bar thing, and I think the excuse was to protect the buttons, and it's where a PCB was exposed at the end there. 